here we are. It's 4 o'clock. It's a Saturday afternoon. I'm Jeff Williams, your host of North Star Oasis. So today we are, uh, okay, I'm catching my breath, folks. There's an important reason behind that. Somebody came in and reset our clocks in the control booth. So as a result, about a minute ago, oh, about a minute ago, my producer and I were having our final prep discussion. And then uh, what happens is we think we have 15 minutes and then all of a sudden we were notified, oh, uh, hey, it's uh, four o'clock. So, all right, heart rate's coming down now. So, uh, here we are. Anyhow, uh, as we uh, begin this episode, we're gonna show you a, a glimpse of stuff that we don't normally see. If you've been paying any attention to politics, I'm not getting into civil war, I'm not getting into history or anything like that today, but if you've been paying any attention to what you see on the screen and on uh, TV, the news cycles on politics, we're gonna show you a little bit of behind the scenes. So when you hear of the, the um, major parties, the Democrat, Republican, and even Independence Party, even though they're a minor player now, when you hear about their state party chairman who comes out and makes the statement in the press, whatnot, well, there's a process in getting that person elected. And so we're going to give you, last week the Republican Party in Minnesota had their state central convention. This is the uh, most active of the activist Republicans. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you a little bit of behind the scenes, uh, more so on some of the other people that you, you don't hear about normally. And as I, uh, again, I feel a little rushed today, so pardon me with, uh, with the um, scatterbrain moments here. That does happen. But I, uh, I guess as is uh, tradition, I want to make sure that everybody remembers that there, uh, well, there are 250 shopping days left until Christmas. See, I got that in. And if you are interested in the, uh, oh, I know what I did. Okay. And then as we talk about politics, this is also a reminder that there are 94 weeks and five days left until the next presidential inauguration. So now that I've got that out of the way, feeling a little bit set up, uh, to get back to my topic, uh, last week the Republican Party had chose, chosen their uh, state party chairperson for the next uh, couple of years. The Democrats do the same thing. And so what we're, we're going to show you are the speeches from the different candidates who uh, were running for, for the various inter-party positions. And so you're going to see that there's more to it than just one, you know, one person getting coronated uh, and that's it, it's a short little tiny meeting. There's a lot more to it than that. So I guess in order for me to get my breath and get everything all focused again, we're going to show you the college Republicans and a skit that, or a little history uh, program that they put together. Excuse me. Let's, hey, ladies and gentlemen, please be quiet while people are talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just nine years later, in 1863, Republican President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all persons held as slaves were and henceforward would be free. and against intense Democrat opposition, Congress passed the 14th Amendment granting citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. This included former slaves recently free. In 1872, the United States' first African-American governor 
Dignity Lynch Rack was in inaugurated in Louisiana. He was a Republican. Fast forward to 1917, when the first woman in Congress, Representative, Representative Jeanette Rankin of Montana, was sworn in. She was a Republican. Later, in 1919, the Republican-controlled 66th Congress passed the 19th Amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. And in 1924, the Republican-controlled 68th Congress and Republican President Calvin Coolidge granted citizenship to Native Americans. Four years later, in 1928, the first Hispanic United States Senator, Octavino La Rosa of New Mexico, was sworn in. He was a Republican. Fast forward to 1949 when Margaret Chase of Maine became the first woman to serve in the U.S. Senate and U.S. House of Representatives. She was a Republican. Five years later, in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education struck down racial, uh, racial segregation in public schools with majority decisions written by Chief Justice Earl Warren, the former governor of California. He was a Republican. Three years later, in 1957, President Dwight Eisenhower signed the Civil Rights Act. He was a Republican. Two years later, in 1959, Hiram Fong, the first Asian American United States Senator, was sworn in in Hawaii. He was also a Republican. After the United States Senate passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act when Republican leader Everett Dirksen defeated a Democrat filibuster. Fast forward to 1981 when Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman on the Supreme Court. She was appointed by Ronald Reagan. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan called for the liberation of East Europeans from communism, words that are written to this day. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In 2001, George W. Bush and American men and women in uniform took the lead in the fight against international terrorism. As Republicans, we have a history that we can be proud of. Republicans and our shared and abiding pursuit of more freedom for all people have helped to shape our country as we strive to make it equal to President Reagan's vision of a shining city on a hill. The five of us are barely 20 years old and we are proud of this history and proud of where our party is headed. We are proud to be Republicans. Thank you. And these are the future leaders of the Minnesota Republican Party. They're just barely 20 years old, as they said, but they're learning the ropes. They're, they're seeing the uh, bigger stage in the political scene. Unfortunately, we don't have, we haven't had the uh, ability to obtain video on the Democrat side yet. So, uh, as soon as we, you know, can. Obtain that kind of footage, we'll uh, take a look and see what's going on on the Democrat side. In the meantime, we had three people who had stepped up for the chairperson, the chairmanship of the Minnesota State Republican Party. Keith, De Keith Downey is currently the incumbent. Uh, he has held a position for the last couple of years. And if you recall, the Republican Party of Minnesota has been embroiled in a... Uh, in a situation of having way too much debt on their books and for fiscal conservatives that is way too much for their likes. Uh, this is an ongoing thing from the past uh, chairmanship. Uh, the things are trying to be cleaned up within the uh, Minnesota Republican Party. So you got a couple of candidates who are standing against Keith Downey. So we're going to go and take a look at the first candidate to speak uh, last Saturday at the Republican State Central Convention, and that is Bill Youngbauer, an activist from West St. Paul. Bill Youngbauer, thank you for being here. Many of you know who I am, but the majority of you do not know my history. As a young man, I slept in the streets, and at one point all I owned were the clothes on my back and a pool cue. When I had the opportunity to sleep indoors, I became familiar with the lifestyles of cockroaches and mice. There were times when I had to do things to survive that I regret to this day. I know that I could have had my record sealed years ago, but my name is not Barack Obama. I live with my past. I don't hide from it. This was a rough way of life, 
one that eventually wore on me. I knew that I had to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, do something constructive with my life. Although I didn't know any better at the time, I voted Jimmy Carter. Despite this, I realized that I'm responsible for my own destiny. I could not rely on the government or mooching off of my fellow man. This is why I became a Republican. I believe in personal responsibility. Because of my early life, I quickly learned to tell the difference between manure and shinola. I am well educated by the school of hard knocks, yet smart enough to hold my own in conversation with anyone. Because of my life experience, I could hold a conversation with a person drinking wine from a bottle in a paper bag or a CEO of a cor corporation. I believe I can speak on the same level with a common voter in this state because I am one. I've been a carpenter for 30 years and have worked in a machine shop for the last four making medical devices. Many of you who know me know I'm, uh, I've am i got a gift of being outspoken. This is both a curse and a gift. Several, a couple of years ago, well last year as a matter of fact, I worked from 6 a.m. till noon, got in my car and was driving to the West St. Paul Parade. On the way I saw a car with a bumper sticker, a Obama bumper sticker. I hopped my horn and flipped him off. <laughs> got their attention and said, damn socialists. <laughs> I saw that John Klein had plenty of volunteers, so I went and walked with the Joe Blum unit. While we were waiting to move on, I saw a uh, someone wandering around, lost. I said, ma'am, what are you looking for? Oh, I'm looking for the Dayton float. I sent her in the wrong direction. <laughs> when I got home that afternoon, oh, this was, this was a loaded afternoon. Uh, I go to the hose, working in the garden. Gentleman with a little vest on and a clipboard at my neighbor's house. What are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm with the SEIU, and I'm drumming up support for unionizing daycare. And I said, my neighbors are Lebanese Catholic conservatives. I'm chair of CD2. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. A couple of years ago, I drove my chopper. I own a 49 Harley chopper. I was driving it through the parking lot of the Capitol last night's session. Senator Torres backed into me. I yelled at her, are you a Democrat? What does that have to do with anything? I says, answer the question, are you a Democrat? I took the time to embellish, limp around, got the Capitol Police involved. <laughs> oh yeah, called the press, great fun. The Capitol Police said to me, Bill, do you know what they did last night? They voted to give illegal immigrants driver's licenses. But yeah, she doesn't even know how to drive. I photographed her bumper. Why is he photographing the left side? That's right, backed into my garbage can. Honest to God. That's the kind of guy I am. I fight the hard fight. I've been involved in the party since 06. My name has been on, on the ballot three times since then. Never afraid to step up. I've served in every position from precinct chair to chair of CD2. I spent five of the last six years as member of the state exec committee under four different chairs. In 2010 and 11, I was a lone voice against uh, questioning the treasurer's reports of Tony Sutton. I smelled manure then and I smell it now. I've witnessed the lack of transparency of the chairman Myself and other members of the State Executive Committee have had to learn recently that vendors that have been owed almost $300,000 have been ignored since last November. I've been the target recently of an anonymous email attack, attack this week. Manure. If someone needs to keep a secret, it means that someone has to have something to hide. I've always believed in transparency. This is your party. I read a story in Forbes magazine many years ago. In it, a man described how, on his first day at work, he received a babushka doll, a little Russian nesting doll, and a letter of welcome. In this letter it said, we hope you do not surround yourself with people smaller than you. That has been my philosophy my whole life when assembling teams. If you elect me chair, the state party headquarters will be run by a minimal staff in this odd off-season year. I will have a cot or a futon in the office because I will be spending nights there. There will be no employees making six figures like there is now. I will work on a part-time basis, as you know. I've talked to my boss about going to three 12-hour days at work. 
As chair of the old House District 39A, we had the third highest bank balance of any BPOU in the state. This was a very liberal district too. As chair of CD2, we had the highest bank balance of any administration in the last 10 years, one of which was headed by our own very national committee woman, Janet Byhofer. Ron Hiddle is a very hardworking man, an experienced fundraiser. I will work with him continually, expanding our fundraising capabilities. We will work like, we will work like Lance Priebus did to pay down the debt of the Republican Party of Wisconsin, as well as the tens of millions of dollars of debt the RNC had when he took over. It is my desire to go national for fundraising efforts. We would have an intern spending time uh, raking through Facebook profiles and finding conservatives that we haven't hit up yet anywhere. Big donors will continue to give to us. They know we are the party of low taxes and freedom from regulations on business. I have a reputation for honesty and transparency. We will bring back the Century Club. All I've heard of that over the last two years is talk. My hands are scarred and my body aches, but I know how to work hard. Those who work for us will work on a hardworking team. If I'm elected, one of the first things I'll do to reach out is to attend next week's NAACP elections in Minneapolis. Like Rand Paul speaking at black colleges, talking about how Democrats are the ones with a history of racism and slavery. I will be with the voters carrying our banner in schools and communities. Anywhere I can speak with voters to preach, to the, rather than preach to the choir about me. Keeping that to a minimum, I will be out there. I have plans for CDs four and five, where it has been evident every election cycle, we do not have the votes to get the job done. Start by printing on white paper like this. Poor people have been voting Democrat for 50 years and you're, we're still, they're still poor. Imagine that going door to door just to plant a seed. I am pro-life and one thing I know for certain, whether you are part of the liberty movement or Christian right here today, not a single one of us wants a penny of our tax dollars spent at an abortion clinic, nor do we want the hand of the government. Nor do we want the hand of government interfering in our private lives. I don't want to lead, I want to serve. I don't want power, I want freedom. Also. I really can't understand why anyone would want this job. <laughs> I'm Bill Youngbauer. Thank you for your vote. Well, before I get into any of, of uh, Mr. Youngbauer's comments, I do want to point out some acronyms that, are, that you may be hearing throughout the, today's program. And those are BPOU, stands for Basic Political Organizational Unit, and then CD for Congressional District. So like uh, Youngbauer mentioned CD2, as a chair of CD2, well, what does that mean for the layperson who doesn't, you know, you love the show, you're here, you're watching us, but you're hearing these acronyms. Yeah, what it means is that the Congressional District organization within the Republican Party is what he was chairing at one point in time. BPOU is the basic uh, building block in politics. Um, I don't know if the... Uh, you know, basic political organization unit. In, in the Republican Party, most of the organizations are along the Senate district legislative lines. Some areas are still by the House legislative district boundaries. So it's just a bunch of people who are like-minded, who gather together and uh, work to get Republicans elected within that kind of a geographical boundary. But there's a couple of things about Mr. Youngbauer's speech that I want to point out. One is his attitude. Um, you know, it sounds like there's something in his past. He mentioned that, how tough he was. Uh, he keeps going back to transparency. But there's just something there that doesn't seem to be transparent. Uh, the other is, you know, again, the flippant remarks. Is that really the front man that the Republican Party really wants to see? They want to see somebody who just appears to be an angry white man. You know, this is the narrative that the Democrats have played against the Republicans for the last number of years. And if the delegates elect Bill Youngbauer's chair, that may very well be what they get. Uh, the other thing is, 
Bill Youngbauer comes from the roots of being a carpenter. I'm sure he does a great job in carpentry, but what kind of Rolodex does he have? What kind of contacts does he have to bigger dollar donors to help get the Republican Party out of that financial mess? And these are the questions that delegates have had in whether or not they should elect Bill Youngbauer. Bill Youngbauer had announced his uh, candidacy on the 1st of April, well, the uh, last day of March, but really hit the news cycles on the 1st of April. Two, uh, about a 10-day campaign before last week's state central convention. And there, I don't think there was really enough time to vet him. I think there's a lot of delegates who had a lot of questions about that. But then, just a couple of days before the state central convention, Neil Lynch stepped out and put his no name in nomination. And so we're going to go and hear Mr. Lynch's speech right now. Minnesota is at a crossroads. We still struggle under the financial burdens that were placed upon us by others. The first time in my life I've been accused of not being loud enough for this gentleman. <laughs> Say no. We're at a crossroads. We still struggle under the financial burdens placed on us by others. We continue to lose statewide elections. Sure, we won the House back last year, but some would argue that we had not that much to do with it. Our base continues to shrink once reliable donors have stopped giving. The disconnect between what activists think should happen and what legislators do seems like it's never been greater. And morale, from what I can see, has been at an all-time low. People are so discouraged, they're so upset that they're looking for even the slightest glimmer of hope to, to show that things are better. And when it doesn't happen and when there's setbacks, whether they're real or perceived, they lash out. They get more cynical, they get more angry, they get less willing to participate. And you know what? Some people are just dropping out. Worse, some have begun to fight internally, looking for someone or something to blame, and we're turning on each other. Why is this happening? Why is our party in decline? I've been in the software business for about 14 years, and, and I can tell you from personal experience, you can have the best marketing, the best messaging, you can have the finest operations, you can even have the best salespeople, and the most money in the bank, by the way. But if your product is poor, or if it turns out you don't have a product after all, people are gonna stop by. So, why is the state party in decline? In my opinion, it's because the Republican Party of Minnesota has a product problem. And voters, especially younger voters, simply aren't buying the product that we're selling anymore. But wait, we're for limited government. Yet the scope of government continues to grow year after year. But wait, wait, we're for free markets, right? Yet Republicans constantly join with the DFL in obstructing free markets through taxation or regulation. But we're for individual rights, right? Yet many Republicans try to use government to tell others how to live their personal lives as if this will somehow change their hearts. And add this to the reputation, which is happily perpetuated by the DFL, by the way, that the Republican Party is just a bunch of old white rich men who hate the poor and hate women and hate minorities and hate gays and hate anybody that's not Christian. Is it any wonder that our numbers are shrinking? You don't think the Republican Party may have a product problem? Consider these points. Republicans haven't won a statewide election in nearly a decade. Our traditional base is no offense, literally dying off. The demographic changes in our state don't go well for us. We get spent out, we get outspent three to one by the DFL, and we remain sad with death. There are some people, and these are usually people who are outside consultants or, or you know, outside groups, they say principles don't matter. We just need to win elections. Well, I'm here to tell you that if we don't find ways to grow this party, if we don't find ways to increase the number of likely Republican voters, we're gonna lose more statewide elections. And in fact, I think we're gonna end up devolving into irrelevancy. One of the delegates that I spoke with this week asked me a very pointed question. He said, and I quote, Neil, how in the hell are you gonna raise millions of dollars? My answer is this, by giving donors something that's worth investing. And that something 
is a revitalized, re-energized party that rallies around the principles of limited government, free markets, and individual rights. These are considered the principles of liberty, and these radical notions are the notions that government should stay out of your wallet and out of your bedroom. These principles, when embraced by the party, articulated to voters, and translated into meaningful legislation, provide the sharpest contrast to the DFL's ultra-progressive agenda. These principles result in the greatest, or will result in the greatest economic boom that our state has ever seen. And you know what? It'll give us something we've never had. The ability to win the emotional argument. What am I talking about? Here's what I mean by that. Why do younger voters stubbornly vote Democrat? It's because of matters relating to personal conduct and civil liberties. I mean, let that sink in for a second. Younger people are gladly giving away their economic liberty to the state because they think the DFL is caring and more inclusive and less intrusive. Imagine for a moment if you applied our principles and took away those arguments from them. Imagine if the DFL couldn't claim the high road on civil liberties and personal freedom anymore. What would they do then? What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. More people, especially younger people, would flock to the Republican Party. Our numbers would grow, new people would get involved, and we would endorse great candidates and give them all the support they need, and then we would win elections, and that's something that donors can invest in. As your chair, I would set the tone. I would attempt to uh, filter all the messages through that lens of those principles. I would also rally our activists to embrace these principles, and I would also influence the inclusion of these, excuse me, back to the second there. I would uh, look to include these principles into our yet-to-be streamlined party platform. And then I would take this revitalized and re-energized party on the road and show it to donors, old and new, of course, the chair is not a dictator. This won't happen today or tomorrow, or even in a week or in months. But if all of us, see from the CD leaders to the BPU leaders down to the newest activists, no matter what segment or wing or faction you may be from, if we can rally around these principles and work together, we will grow our party, we will win elections, and we will become the majority party in this state. So, why am I doing this? Why did I come at the 11th hour? Am I, am I, is this payback? Is this to settle an old score? Is it because I want to run for governor someday? That was a lot, that was a lot Now, I'm doing this for my children. I have three wonderful children. I call them Lawson. Megan, Chris, and Nelson. Let me tell you something about Chris. About two years ago, she came out. She's gay. She also turned 18 last month. And if nothing happens, which party do you think that she's going to vote for and support next year? My name is Neil Lynch, and I humbly ask for your vote. Because this party is worth saving. And I want all of my children someday to be able to say, I'm a proud Republican. Thank you. that we had shown, because uh, Mr. Lynch keeps talking about how young people are not buying our product, we had five college Republicans at the very beginning of the show saying how proud they were to be a Republican. Uh, evidently, Mr. Lynch was not in the room when that particular skit was going on. Uh, he mentions he's from the software business, uh, but he keeps talking about the internal fights. Now, I will mention that he does, count, he, both he and Mr. Youngbauer come from the liberty side of politics, and we always hear about r the uh, liberty versus establishment. That's the division. I keep hearing that, but Mr. Lynch seems to be on, the, on one of that side of that divide, and where, for the Repub sake of the Republican Party, where is that cooperation getting along? That faction from the liberty side to the establishment is just as bad as the faction in Washington between your Republicans and your Democrats. So then let's take a look at what the current incumbent has to say. Oh, I also mentioned, I forgot to mention that uh, 
what kind of Rolodex does Mr. Lynch have? And that's the question. You know, really, when it comes to the state re state Republican Party chair, it's the same thing on the Democrat side, the state Democratic Party chair. The position requires a big Rolodex, get the money, motivate the activists, win the elections. That's what the chairmanship is all about. And it's that way on really all three, if you include the Independence Party. Uh, my friend Mark Jenkins has actually been the uh, chairman there for a couple of years. I've known people on all three of those, ma those major parties at the higher levels. The thing is, they all have identical structures. They all have chairs who have to motivate a activist base while still appealing to the financial base. And that's the position of the chairmanship. You also have the deputy chair, you have the um, secretary and treasurer positions, but all three of them have the same type of corporate organizational governance structure. All three of those parties have similar problems with divergent groups, and so nothing really seems to change. It's the same thing, whether it's Republican, Democrat, Independence Party, all three of those are identical, just with different ideological philosophies and some little minor governance uh, procedures that are different, but the overall overarching structure remains the same. So now let's take a look at what the current chair, uh, chairman, the incumbent who is running for re-election, Keith Downey, a former legislator, let's see what he's got to say. Well, I'm Keith Downey and I actually do want this job. <laughs> One year ago today, four Republican statewide candidates had declared that they would go to the primary. And no one believed that the Republican Party of Minnesota could hold a convention, much less endorse good candidates, much less win the primary, much less have a chance in the 2014 election. When those four candidates made that decision months before, they saw our endorsement as a barrier, if not an outright liability, liability and the media loved it. But 2014 was the year you proved everyone wrong. You endorsed candidates that won the primary. And if Jeff Johnson had 30 more days and Mike McFadden had 30 million more dollars, they might be in office today. <laughs> Two years ago today, I've been on the job for three days with a plan and your support and a belief that the Republican Party is indeed right for the people of Minnesota, and without much else, we embarked on a turnaround. Together, we put in place a blue ribbon finance team, renewed our fundraising, re-energized our Elephant Club donor group, restructured our operation, replaced our infrastructure, quadrupled our voter IDs, rebuilt our team, cut our costs, stabilized our finances, restructured our debt, revamped our communications, launched a new social media capability, began the Growth and Opportunity Party brand, revitalized our state fair booth, energized our events, ran exciting Lincoln Reagan dinners, launched the Solution Center, moved our office, increased our focus and commitment to minority outreach, formalized our affiliate groups, implemented GAP accounting, and regained control of our campaign finance reporting, and professionally ran our caucuses and conventions. And we had a great convention, we defended our endorsement, and delivered a statewide early absentee and victory program. That's a lot. And as I look back, it's only by the grace of God, frankly, because when you survey that progress that together we've made, it seems a bit amazing. And guess what? It's only the cost of entry. It's not nearly enough to win consistently. The goal of a political party is not to get into position to win, it's to win everything. We have to win the presidency, hold the U.S. Senate, hold the U.S. Congress, hold our majority in the Minnesota House, win the majority in the Minnesota Senate, and increase our Republican congressional delegation here in Minnesota. And let's be clear, that's not going to happen because we wish it so. It takes a plan, a real plan, and you have mine. It takes operations, it takes candidates, it takes message, and it takes activists. And most of all, it takes standing on principle. But it also takes money. Much has been made in this campaign about our debt, and I certainly don't diminish its importance or the seriousness of paying our bills. I couldn't agree more. And it's a strategic priority for us again in 2015. 
But make no mistake, if we're going to win everything, whoever wins this chair election today will show up on Monday morning and have to raise $100,000 in April, and another $100,000 in May, and another, and another. On Monday morning, who will they call? Who will believe in them enough to write the checks? Here's my call list for Monday. 43 individuals who believed enough in our party and what we were doing these past two years to give us between $5,000 and $500,000 each. And another 125 who gave $1,000 per year. I'm ready for Monday. I'm ready for 2015. And I'm downright excited about our prospects in 2016. Let me close with this. Remember how far we've come. The turnaround is over and the comeback begins. But it doesn't start with tearing down, it starts with building up. It doesn't start with subtraction, it starts with addition. And within our GOP coalition, it's an and proposition, not or. I believe in what we're doing, and I believe in you. And I believe we are right for the people of Minnesota, and I believe Minnesota and our country need us badly. If I didn't, I wouldn't be running again. But here's the deal, all the money, all the operations, all the candidates, all the message, all the principle, it's for not if we cannot come together to win. We need everyone, each one of you in this room, every one of you, every group, every district, every precinct, every legislator, every, every, one to win, that's it, one to win. Thank you and God bless you all. So what were the results? Last week, the State Republican Party chairmanship election. Bill Youngbauer, the first candidate that we had seen in the, uh, in the video clips, got 33 votes out of around 340 possible votes. So he had less than 10% of the total vote total. Neil Lynch, he pretty much doubled what... Bill Youngbauer did. He got around somewhere. I've heard estimates. Some say 59. Some say 66. But he got in the in the 50 range, or around around 60. So he essentially got 20 percent. Keith Downey, the last person you heard, who was the current chair, was reelected with around 240 possible vote, uh, 240 votes out of around 340 total possible. So that was the election for the chairmanship. But now when you read this in the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press, what do you read? Oh, Downey's reelected. But do you see what's going on behind the scenes? Do you see that split? Do you see the choices that you have with the other candidates? And we're, I think, the only TV show or one of the few that will actually show you all three. But right now we're actually going to run over to another race that was held uh, in just a moment uh, for... I believe it was Treasurer, we had Ryan Love versus Michael Cummins. Michael Cummins, I do recall, ran for Congress in the 8th Congressional District against Jim Oberstar. I think that was back in 2008. Okay, and this is the Secretary's race, and I don't know who Ryan Love is other than I believe he ran for a state legislative position in the last election cycle. So it was Ryan Love, if I recall, uh, from, I was not at the State Central Convention, so I do not know the speaking order, but I'm trying to give it to you in the best manner that we can, we can remember. Uh, we had a cameraman there of who had spoken. So we're going to go with Ryan Love, who is a candidate. Oh, and uh, Ryan ran for the deputy chair last time. Okay, that's why I had heard Ryan Love's name before. Well, we're going to show you Ryan Love's speech. Sorry, I'm not as tall as Randy. Thank you so much for coming today. This is what I love. The people that are engaged in the party, and this is what we need to win the elections. I grew up mostly in Iowa, but my parents were, my dad's from South Dakota, my mom's from Arkansas. So we had some fun times with interpreters and stuff like that, especially with my grandmother. My, my grandmother would talk to my dad and she'd say, you know, you don't have to worry about me because I have barrel insurance. Like, what? Barrel insurance, you know? When you die in the barrel yet? Yeah. When, when she got up to South Dakota for the, their wedding, 
She called up my dad's mom to get directions the final way and they had to get an interpreter on the line. <laughs> this is what we need in the Republican Party. We all want the same thing. We all want to grow. We all have the right direction that we need to move. But we need the networks in place and that's something that I can bring. We need the people talking together so that rather than the state party telling you, here's what we want you to think, you have the state party coming to you, what is the most important question you have that you need answered from the Republican Party? We get people engaged. We ask them, we ask them, can I take this question to the state party and come back to you with an answer? And now they're looking forward to the state party coming to visit their door. You go to these network groups, you get the Second Amendment people talking together, the Child Care Union people talking together, so that they're going to have, not keep repeating the same thing over and over, reinventing the wheel, but coming up with the best solution. And working with the legislators who are going to promote these things, so we can get the Republican Party coming up with the best answers for the entire state. I was the secretary for the Scott County VPOU. I was also the secretary for the second congressional district, so I do have the background there. In the real world, the private sector, I was an administrative assistant to a dean at a major university. And I can tell you, you have to work your, you have to work hard in order to get up that high. I went back to college, I got a computer degree, I'm highly technical, work with databases every day, and those of you who have worked with the databases with the state party know how much we could do to clean these up. We're on, I've been in Minnesota five and a half years. In that time, we're on our fourth database. And yes, it's the National Party's database, and it's better than the one we had, but it's still not the latest and greatest that we could have. There's tabs there that we could use to target our audience. So rather than sending you information about stuff that might not be an interest of yours, we can send you the information that will get you engaged. And we can do this across the state. I'm not a politician. Our chair, our deputy chair, they've ran for office and stuff like that. I think we need someone who is a grassroots guy at the state level, someone who's helped on campaigns. This last election, I worked on Ross Peterson's campaign as her campaign manager. We were the only campaign to be an incumbent in the whole metro area. Imagine someone up at the state level that can help more than just a few candidates. That's what I want to do. Any candidate who came to me, any BPOU officer who asked for help, I was there. I, I'm diligent on Google, I dig up information, I'm on social media, Twitter, some people say I tweet too much. Uh, I've cut back, I'm down to about 9,000 tweets a year now. But I have over 2,000 followers. I got engaged in the Black Lives Matter hashtag and I ended up with about 30 more followers from that group because some of them told me, you listen to me, I appreciate that. And that's what we need to do. If we want people to come back to the party, we need to listen to them. If you saw on my leaflet, I have a lot of endorsements from a lot of chairs. I, have, I consider myself part of the conservative group, the libertarian group, the Tea Party group, the Republican women, Republican men, the college Republicans, because I want all of these groups to succeed, and I will listen to them. I drum up membership for them. I help across the entire state. I've donated to candidates in probably every congressional district and helped in every congressional district as well. I do leaflets, I stuff envelopes, I make phone calls. I'm one of those people that you want on your side. Help me to help the Republican Party. Please elect Ryan Love as your next secretary for the state party. And once again, we always get to say, everybody wants love. Thanks very much. Now, we're just uh, reminding you to sh that we're showing you this because we want to show you that 
there's more to what goes into running a political party operation and there's more divergent voices than what you would get in your standard media. And so that was Kevin Love, uh, Ryan Love, Kevin Love. He was a basketball player, used to have Minnesota uh, connections. Uh, but that was Ryan Love who was running for the Minnesota Republican Party secretary position. Now, one thing about that, that I find funny with the inter-party um, the inner party speeches, and I and I hear this on all three sides: the Independence Party, Democrat Party, Republican Party. Is when you have the people go up and say the words, "I'm not a politician." Uh, you're running for a political office. Yes, you are. So yes, Ryan Love is a politician. He, especially when he had run for a previous position, he is a politician. They are all politicians. But now we're going to hear. Ryan Love's opponent, Mike Cummins. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Cummins, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Before I get started this morning though, as chairman of the Minnesota Organization of Republican Veterans, I would like to thank all of you who have served or have family members who serve. And I would I also want to personally re um, thank Representative Detmer for his hard work um, as Chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee down at the State Capitol and all of his members on, the, on, the, on their committee. If you're interested in knowing what's going on down at the State Capitol, Monday morning at 9 o'clock is our main meeting, the Military Action Group meeting. We meet at the third floor of the State Office Building we have people from all over the state come out and learn about what we're doing and what's happening down at the state capitol and you are all welcome to attend. I also want to thank our House and Senate members here today. You are the front lines fighting for our values, keeping Minnesota a place where we can enjoy all the blessings God has given us. We also need to take, it's, that's why it is so important that we increase our majority in the Minnesota House. Our House members are, are, are basically putting their fingers in a dike and trying to hold back the, um, the bad policy that the, the Democrats in the Senate and our governor continues to push at us. And we need to thank all of our House members that are here today. But we know that we can take back the Senate because we did it. In 2010, we took back the Senate and we need to do that next year. We need to work with David Hamm in finding solid, conservative Senate candidates and make sure we get them the information that they need. And we, we need to take back that Senate. Because because we cannot afford another two years like the last two years. If we don't take back the House and we don't take back the Senate, the Democrats are going to come at us with a vengeance. And that is not a joke. Now. As an organization, we need to eliminate our party's debt. This is holding our party back from success and the people of Minnesota deserve. In 2010, we proved that Minnesota, that Republicans can win local elections. We are having trouble winning statewide elections. But if we continue to get down into the grassroots and support our local candidates, over time, we are going to take back our statewide offices. I've been working with candidates, local BPOUs, and I want to personally thank Tom Swain, our new chairman of Pine County, and I look forward to working with him this year. The, um, the 8th District, I want to thank Ted and the 8th District Executive Board, who I've been proud to serve with since 2011, and the State Party. I'm um, working with, uh, with Janet on more events, with our, new ch uh, with our current chairman, our current uh, uh, Deputy Chair, and I look forward to helping on the State Executive Committee. I thank you for your support today, and I hope I can earn your trust as your next Secretary of the Minnesota Republican Party. Thank you very much. That was Mike Cummins, who ran for the Secretary of the Minnesota Republican Party. Now, the one thing I will say is that these are all great people that Minnesota can be proud of. Whether they won or lost, whether Republican or Democrat, the fact is they did not 
stand on the sidelines and look and, and just say, oh, I don't want to get involved with that. No, all of these people you're seeing today and when we highlight the Democrats or in the Independence Party, all of the people who run for office there are all great people. And they're people that we can be proud to have representing our state. Now, the results of that election that Ryan Love won, it was somewhere around a two to one margin. Uh, Mike Cummins uh, just didn't have what it takes, but on the other hand, you know, you got to give both of these guys the, you know, commendations for the effort. Now, there's one other race that we're going to show you, and that was the deputy chair. Every chair should have a deputy. And in the interest of time, we're only going to show you uh, the first two minutes of each of the candidate's speeches. And I know some of you are saying, thank God I can't stand any more political speeches this hour. Nine more minutes. Just hang in there. Here's Dave Thule, who ran for uh, the deputy chair. All right. Good morning. It is still morning. I apologize for those of you I have not met. This was kind of a last minute thing. Uh, but I am Dave Thule. I'm running for deputy chair. For those of you that don't know me, I'm married with two kids. I live in Owatonna, Minnesota. I'm co-chair of the Steele County Republican Party. I'm a for former CD1 chair and former member of the state executive committee for the last few years. I retired from the Minnesota National Guard after 22 years of service last year. It's my honor to serve this country. And I am the post commander of the Owatonna VFW for the past three years. Thank you. I joined the Republican Party on January the 20th, 2009. Does anybody in this room know what that date was? Oh. Yes, that was a momentous date for our country. I joined because I could no longer sit on the sidelines uh, of our political process. I got politically involved while I was in Iraq, and when I came home, I couldn't just sit on the sidelines anymore. I ran for state representative in 2010 when our endorsed candidate dropped out shortly before the filing deadline, and I got creamed pretty good by a Democrat down in Owatonna. So I know what it means to lose. I know what it means to fight the good fight even when you don't think you're gonna win. I do believe in Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment. Thou shalt not speak ill of fellow Republicans. So I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna talk about myself. So here's what I would do as deputy chair. I have no ambition to climb the political ladder. You will never see me running for chair of this party. It is not, not my ambition. I simply have a desire to serve what I've been called to do so. I'm not the type to work the room as good policy. Well, again, in the interest of time, I'd love to have shown you more of Dave Thule's uh, speech. Uh, he does say he knows what it's like to lose, and he's there to fight the good fight, and he got creamed by a Democrat in Owatonna. Uh, unfortunately, those are the only highlights I can give you here, because now we're going to go to Chris Fields, the current deputy ch uh, chair of the Minnesota Republican Party. How are you folks doing? Good? Yeah. Outstanding, outstanding. Yeah. And I just want to thank Dave Thule. I'll tell you what, that takes a lot of courage to stand up here and, and run for an office. And I think Dave's a good Republican. Uh, he's an Army guy, but that's okay. You guys are all going to Hoorah! Hoorah! You guys know what Army stands for, right? Ain't ready to be Marines yet. Well, I got Ted Daly, man. Ted Daly's going to be in business uh, if I say stuff like that again. All right. Hey, look, folks, you guys know me. I'm a straight shooter. Uh, up until a little while ago, I didn't have a, a, an opponent in this race. Uh, so, hey, we'll spare the pageantry here. Um, I do have some things I'm um, grateful that I get to talk to you about, okay? And so, uh, I've been out on the road. Uh, for the last couple months talking to BPOUs at their conventions and CDs, and I talked about three things, okay? And what I said was, uh, now is the time for us to pay down our debt, okay? And I said that the party of fiscal responsibility must be the party of fiscal responsibility. And, and so, I don't look at us as the party of Wall Street. Okay, we don't finance that. We're the party of the Main Street. We pay our bills. Okay? And the second thing I said was we, we need to speak boldly and clearly. And I made some observations about how sometimes our message gets lost in the translation of voters. 
Okay, and the last thing I said was that we need to be proud uh, to be Republicans. Okay, we, we absolutely need to be proud of Republicans. Look, uh, none of us are perfect, at least of all me. Uh, but the policies and the candidates that we support help make us a more perfect union, and we need to be proud of that. And like Dave, I'm not going to spend my time running against uh, an opponent here. Uh, what I've talked about here recently is uh, what I believe in. Okay? And for me, it's a matter of leadership by example. That's something that they taught me in the Marines, and I can't uh, ever forget that uh, message, that, those lessons. Okay? And so, uh, what I said here over the last couple of days is as an organization, as an organization, we need to spend our next couple of years not just raising money and doing all the things that Keith uh, and the other candidates talked about. Those are good things, important things to do. But as an organization, as a Republican Party, we kind of need to tighten up a couple of things, okay? And that's how I look at it. Uh, so what I said specifically was that we need better transparency and accountability, okay? The State Central Committee, okay, in our Constitution and in our bylaws is responsible for the management and the business uh, of this party. It says specifically, and I quote, uh, Article 2, Section 1 of our bylaws, the business and property of the party shall be managed by a state central committee. And my feeling is that you can't adequately manage our party if you don't have the authority to pass a budget. Okay? You can't ad adequately manage our party if you don't have a copy of our financials so that you can help us make some decisions. I do believe that. And again, uh, that was Chris Fields. Uh, Chris had run as a candidate again uh, a couple of years ago against Keith Ellison for uh, Congress in uh, Congressional District 5. And uh, Dave Thule, 22-year uh, Army National Guard veteran. You know, again, th this is you know, exemplary people, and we're just trying to show you, you know, that there are you know, multiple voices of, can of candidates for the internal party offices and what they stand for. And unfortunately, we only have one hour allotment of time, and that's not always enough to give, you know, every, you know full round to everything. Uh, I would have loved to have been able to show all of both Dave Thule's and uh, Chris Field's speeches, but we've only got a little over a minute left here. Uh, Chris Fields did win. Uh, I guess the prediction of I know what it's like to lose and uh, fight the good fight, that was Dave Thule. But I think Dave just wanted to go up there and make sure that nobody was opposed, that there was every, every candidate who was an incumbent had somebody as the voice of opposition, even within the Republican Party. And Chris uh, won heavy-handedly, but Dave went up and just wanted to give a speech and provide an outlet. And there's some nobility to be said about that as well. This just shows one side of the equation. This is what the Republican Party stands for. These are the people who are running the state, exec the executive uh, organization of that particular office. And in the interest of fairness, that when we can get access to the Democrats and the Independence Party, we will also be doing what we can to cover that. But in the meantime, we've got more things coming up, but that's all going to be having to wait for another week. And that's, of course, if we can. Well, of course we can. We will. But right now, have a great week. We'll see you next week.